In addition, the South Pole is actually expanding. If the current warming trend continues the next 200 years, the sea will only rise by one foot. Hardly cause for a concern. The planet is not crying out for help. It is a massive ecosystem that is not only weathering man quite well indeed, but actually positively prospering. Climate modeling is the future, not the present. One day we'll have a model that will encapsulate all the fundamental processes that make up our environment. Even then, due to the intrinsic chaos of this dynamic system, we would probably be only able to predict to a certain confidence level the weather. CO2 is the flavor of the month, but in many ways it's hard to justify as the dominant force driving our climate. We just don't have substantial evidence supporting it. Until we do, can we explain at least qualitatively the major drivers that are leading to the current global warming? Fortunately, the answer is yes, and these forces, unlike CO2, do have substantial amounts of evidence supporting them. But what are these possible forces? Plants absorb CO2. Ice reflects sunlight. Greenhouse gases absorb sunlight. And clouds both absorb and reflect sunlight. These all influence the greenhouse effect, and thus temperature, but are they the primary drivers of Earth's climate? What really feeds the system its energy? The sun and the sea. In particular, we could be really looking at the cycles of sunspots, which are flares of intense magnetic activity and the ocean currents. It is likely that global temperature is controlled by solar energy and then modulated by that phenomenal sump of energy that is the world's oceans. The solar and oceanic cycles sometimes offset and sometimes complement each other. The many other influences, such as man-made CO2, are relatively minor and often offset each other. There are substantial amounts of evidence showing correlations between both sunspot activity and oceanic cycles with global temperature. However, how do these climate forcings stand up as an alternative explanation of the current global warming? In this graph, we have both sunspot activity and the Pacific Decadal Oscillation, a significant oceanic current, also known as the PDO, plotted against resultant global temperature. Is there a correlation and perhaps even causality? Over the last century, whenever both the sun is active and the PDO is in a warm phase, such as pre-World War II, then there has been significant global warming. However, at times, these forces have conflicted, such as in the post-war era of the 50s, and they can largely cancel each other out. This results in a rather stable temperature. More recently, in just the last 10 years, the sun has been fairly active but was neutralized by the PDO turning to a cool phase. This stalled any further warming and perhaps could be seen as a slight cooling. Most importantly, whilst the sun and sea hypothesis accounts for recent temperatures accurately, the climate models did not. Thus, looking at the evidence, it's plausible that while sunspots activity is the primary driver of temperature over the last 300 years of global warming, the oceans have acted as a modulator of this overall trend, flexing it in the short term. Now CO2 does matter. It does have a greenhouse effect, and warming from it is real. It is not totally being discounted. However, without the unsubstantiated 2.5 times multiplier, CO2-driven global warming is relatively small. The bulk of the global warming we've seen for the past three centuries can be readily explained by the sun's activity. 
Recent man-made CO2 is just a thin cream on the top. The very low solar activity of the 1600s, known as the Maunder Minimum, wiped out Viking civilization in Greenland. The next period of inactivity, the Dalton Minimum of the early 1800s, was characterized by the London Frost Fairs. Since then, the global weather has warmed and likewise the sunspot activity risen. Coincidence? The correlation between sunspots and temperature has long been recognized and has stood the test of time. As far back as 1801, William Herschel noted an apparent connection between wheat prices and sunspot records. The evidence for sunspots being a primary driver in climate change is considerable. So why have we suddenly put the finger of blame on CO2? It's the sunspots. Give credit where credit is due. It is possible, though far from proven, that man-made CO2 could trigger a tipping point that could send temperature catastrophically out of control. However, as for our current global warming, there are somewhat more convincing, substantiated drivers, primarily sunspots and also the oceans. The current gentle warming they draw in is far from catastrophic, it is beneficial. So far, we have cited where possible the least controversial, most universally acceptable data sets. Global warming is a hot topic and controversy is always going to exist, but we've tried to concentrate on using non-biased, middle-of-the-road data. For example, we use the IPCC's version of the CO2 record, which shows the 200-year exponential rise in CO2. For the sake of argument, we've accepted this as fact. Let me explain. We have debated the issues using their data, but shedding an alternative light on the possible conclusions. Let's take one step back and hopefully, without muddying the waters too much, question two of the fundamental data sets, which are the foundation of the IPCC's argument, the temperature and the CO2 records. All the records will show it. The IPCC CO2 record of the past two centuries is made up of two parts. Low quality ice core samples up until 1957 and high quality infrared spectroscopy thereafter. Why have they used these ice core samples when at best they can give a rolling 20 year average? Well, if that's all we had to work off, then fair enough. However, that is not the case. We have at hand highly accurate data derived from chemical methods carried out by many international groups, some decorated with Nobel Prizes. Why has this massive body of top quality work been ignored? Well, by looking at the difference in results, the answer may become apparent. Ice core data corroborates with CO2 driven global warming. We have been churning out masses of CO2 since World War II. But according to high quality records, the CO2 in the atmosphere has actually dropped slightly. Today's so-called dangerous level of 380 parts per million is significantly lower than 1940 and 1820. This noticeably contradicts global warming theory. In addition, CO2 changes lag temperature by five years. How can this be possible? Well, it is if you assume that temperature drives CO2, not the other way around. The well-known mechanism is as follows. Oceans contain the vast majority of the planet's CO2. By varying temperature, you slowly vary the amount it can hold, and thus the amount that resides in the atmosphere. The IPCC have ignored the existence of 200 years of high-quality CO2 measurements. These clearly show that CO2 is naturally highly variable, and also that it lags temperature. CO2 is not the driver, but the driven. The IPCC championed the surface temperature record over that of satellites and balloons which monitor atmospheric temperatures. It is true that there is a great debate that rages over the comparative merits of the three data methodologies. Satellites have only a continuous record since 79, and balloons have non-standard instrumentation. But combined, they give a corroborating, unpolluted and global record since 58. The surface temperature record goes back to the late 1800s, but is far from clean. The number of stations has declined significantly over the years, and the quality is often questionable. 